Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Cork in the North. In our new look studio, I just want to thank everybody that has uh, stuck with us over the last couple of weeks. We released a couple of Patreon episodes out to the public as well because we had to move and it, we were not going to be able to sort of record until we got this set up. So we do appreciate it. Hope you like it. Producer Sean is still here with us. Hello, Sean. Hello. Yes, he's on the other side of the desk now. He's running all the tech. We're up to new cameras, new setup, new furniture. Um, you may see behind me a little bit of a gap. Uh, sponsors, if you want to sponsor the pod, you can go in there as well. And um, We've got acrylic signs coming in that are all being made. We're going to have little cards here. We've got some of our old artwork. We're adding new artwork. Um, we're also going to be announcing our live show in December. Um, tickets will go on sale to the patrons first. Um, the capacity is only going to be 100 people and they could all be sold out uh, before uh, we could even release it to the public. So if you do want to sign up for extra episodes... Uh, please do sign up to the Patreon. It's three pound a month, and we're going to be releasing four ep- extra episodes a month, which is one episode a week, along with the free episodes you get on Thursday at six o'clock. So all the links are in the description below on the YouTube, um, and also on my Instagram in my link tree. Please do follow, like, share, subscribe, and support the podcast like you have done. We really do appreciate it. Okay, uh, we're up. We're here in where Colin Geddes does his podcast, General Banter, and the Bomb Squad. Um, so yeah so people who followed us from the start we started with nothing now we're in a lovely posh new studio we're going to be adding loads of things over the next couple of weeks and uh, yes uh, so here we are so our first guest this week ladies and gentlemen joining us um, uh, in the new studio is a comedian from England who I've worked with probably for the last 10 years on and off we see each other every couple of months he came on the radio this morning on Q Radio he's overdoing the empire with me and I thought we have to get him on because he's coming back again in January to do his own tour show He's been on Live at the Apollo, Radio 4, loads of stuff all over uh, the UK. He doesn't get to Ireland that often. And I thought while he was here, he has to come onto the podcast. Scott Bennett, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. How are you? Really good, mate. It's really amazing. Good. To, it's amazing to see you because every time I would have seen you, you would normally just be in a green room. Yeah. In or, a club in England. Passing a door. Passing a door. I mean, yeah. how was that? Yeah, yeah. They were all right. Good crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know That's I mean? it. It's, it's weird, isn't it? It's been, I think we spent more time together today than we've ever done yeah but that's the thing with comedy isn't it when you work with comics you know you just spend that weekend with them whether you're in yeah. Birmingham or Glasgow or London or Leeds or whatever you know and obviously I don't really do that as much yeah because I'm I'm based over here now so when I whenever I see you guys coming over here or whatever I know a lot of the comics that I know in England would tap me up because oh where's good to go in Belfast and stuff and I always like recommend the clubs or whatever it is like so it's good to see you how often do you come to Belfast um not that often I think I think I come and do the Empire but I've, I've never done a tour date here, right. so this is an, it's all new for me, really. Yeah. Um. So I've I've not I've never I, I just thought it was about time that I came and did a tour show yeah. here. Yeah. And when you would come to Belfast, are you flying in, flying out? Yeah. In hotel, gig, bit in, of food, out again. You don't get to see the place. <laughs> not really. No. No. Uh, although. I, I like where I am. I sort of walk about. I quite like walking. I'm a bit Mick Dundee. Do you know what I mean? I oh, sort yeah. of go go walking. Do you drop eggs on the floor and let stones <laughs> play and still feed it to people? Yeah, I do. And, and where I'm staying now, uh, is it, we, there used to be a different hotel I'd stay in that was like either really hot or you'd have yeah. to open the window and it was really noisy. Yeah. So you had to choose between being too hot. Sweating or, or can't sleep. Or can't sleep. So it was like, a, but now where I am, it's really nice. It's the first time I've ever slept properly in a hotel room last night. Really? Yeah, I'm not good. I don't know if you're the same. I love a hotel. Do you like a hotel? They're the most corrupt places in the world. Yeah, they are. And I think people, when you go and stay in a hotel, don't you think it just, you live like a rock star? Oh, and you live filthy as well. Filthy. Like, filth, yeah, that, absolute filth. I sometimes, I always put that do not disturb sign on the door. Because dis- disturbing, not, th- disturbing it, things are happening in that yeah, room. Yeah, it's not, it's not because I want extra sleep. It's because I can't cannot inflict the filth <laughs> on an innocent uh, housekeeping member of staff because they, it looks like, you know, it's Kurt Cobain's final weekend. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's stuff everywhere. Like I think something happens to you when you're in a hotel room where you just start going, I'm going to take the handbrake off. Yeah. You know, there's using how many towels you're going to use to dry yourself. All of them. All of them. Are you going to put them on the floor to be cleaned up? No, I'm going to no, hang them back up I'm again. I'm going to hang them back up. And then what you're going to do, I'm going to scatter my toiletries. Everywhere. Like, it looks like I've been banging up gear. Yeah. And then just, it, and, and I, feel, I always feel there's that moment of shame. And if you've done the Dubai gigs, I'm I've sure you them, have. Yeah. They've got a different sort of etiquette. Have you noticed this? No. What? They will come in. Oh, you're just, you're just, they'll just, come, just in, yeah. come in. So I've had it before where I've been sort of living like filth, like the Motley crew. And uh, someone will just come in and fold my pants. Yeah. In front of me. Yeah. And I was like, you don't need to fold. Please don't. There's 
you're going to end up pregnant. There's so much DNA on that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, please don't switch those pants. It's like, but I, I think something happens and I want to know what it is. Because someone said to me as well, and, and it's stuck in my head, this, those remote controls, I don't want to know where they've been. Oh. In a hotel. Yeah. And as soon as someone said that to me, it's I, I cannot get past. Well, that. they say the dirtiest thing in a hotel room is the cushions on a bed, not the pillows, because the sheets get changed. Right, but it's the cushion. Really? Yeah, like you know, you get to the bed, you have two pillows, and then you might have a little cushion on in between the pillows as a little deck. I lick those. Decoration. That's terrible. I shouldn't shouldn't do that. Oh, I mean, it's 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 the debauchery, and I think it is because you never get that chance in your normal life. Yeah, because you pay for it, and you feel entitled. And like I stay in hotels, we we stay in hotels a lot, and I get into a routine. I know, like I know how to travel now in terms of what to bring and what not to bring. Right. And when I get into hotels, it's kind of like say if I'm going to Glasgow, you stay in the motel one at yeah. the Glee. Beautiful hotel. Yeah, it's a great hotel, right? I'm not promoting it or anything. It's just a great That's hotel. The first chain. sponsor. First, <laughs> don't worry. It's just a really good hotel. Yeah. But as soon as I get in, I know exactly what I'm getting in that room. Right. I'm getting a hairdryer that's attached to the wall. Yeah. I'm getting a nice clean. I'm getting a chair, a desk, a small little puff or something like that like you know a little seaty thing yeah. and I bring my food in and I, I just fill the bill fill, fill the bin up of shit and so I, I often leave I get into bed with my socks on take my socks off while I'm asleep and then I leave the hotel and they're pulling the sheets back when I'm gone and I've, I've left the hotel I've gone home they pull back there's always fucking socks underneath I always end up leaving socks there yeah. you become corrupt because you're, you're used to when you go to bed at night that's your space that's your um, smell that's your bed sheets. That's your bed. That's your dirt. That's your filth. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying everyone's house is filthy, but my point is, is that when you get yeah. to a hotel, you resort back to this is mine. I think, and I can be myself. I can pick my toenails, whatever you know. I think you regress to being a teenager again. Yeah. It's like I, this. I think I think you become fifteen again. It's like the mum's going to sort this out. Yeah. It's like they say when you go and visit your parents, you become a child again. Absolutely. You walk into that house and automatically you are a child, not a parent. Like you're a parent. You walk in, you to, to your parents' house, and you go in and go, "Hi, do you want a cup of tea? I'm home now. They do everything for me." Yeah. Well, the most common thing that's Googled in married couples now is separate bedrooms. Do you know this? I thought, right. Because people are living separately. They, they, they've, but, I think people have realised that much as you, you, you want to be together, I don't think sharing a bed with someone, if you actually think about how intimate that is, you're never getting a good night's sleep. I love sharing a bed. Do you? With my girlfriend. Love it. I think we've gone past that now. <laughs> well, I think we get You to have the a point. great joke. You've been married to your wife how long? <clears throat> Three mattresses. Three mattresses. And how many mattresses? Is there 10 years of mattress? No, four uh, years well, of mattresses? Well, we're on a memory foam, so the system doesn't really work now. But I think it was, um, yeah, I think we're about two mattresses in. How long are you with your wife? Uh, we met at uni. So oh, I've wow. been with Gemma now. God, I met her in 1997. You're only like 40 or something. 44. Fuck me, mate. You met your wife in 1997? Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? No so affair. It's the longest commitment. Never, never had an affair. No, no. <laughs> you give it a go, man. Like, Imagine if I'd it's a bit said, exciting, yes, isn't it? Like to have yeah. an affair. Join the PS and I hear the police here. Everyone in the police here is having a fucking affair, aren't they? Um, PS and I. The amount of stories I hear. We uh, we met in Freshers Week, which was a really oh sort of, me. I know it's the worst time I to know, meet them. I, I basically checked out because I thought if I carry, you know, this is the only interest I've had. Let's just let's just stick here. What uni? <laughs> Loughborough. Oh, that's like an athletics uni, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's the only time you see people running at sort of four in the morning. They're either running uh, away from you or... Running, just running around, running away from me and my affair. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I want to have an affair. What would you in. do if you found out your wife was having it? I don't know. I, know, I don't know. Because you know what I think about people who have affairs? I don't know how they're doing it. And it's not the guilt, mm. it's the admin. That's yeah, what I WhatsApp. don't understand. The, yeah, WhatsApps, the WhatsApps, the burner phones. Like, I've never been <laughs> married. just you're mad. I've never been married, right? But I have, like gone out with people who were separated but still married but not divorced oh wow and they were and they were like you know you're going i'm talking about going on dates now like i'm not like yeah. moving in with them or anything like you know you I was in london in my early 30s single having a great time yeah. comedian blah 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 downloading all the apps and i mean every app every i'll take anything grinders fucking tinder i'll take the whole lot just right? eat just eat deliver room <laughs> And if, if somebody knocks on my door, there's a potential opportunity for a date. <laughs> Bring your biryani in. Come on, yeah, yeah, move yeah. in. Here's the key. Come on, and let me tell you about my childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I just want to leave, mate. Don't leave. But like, you Have get a to a, I know, yeah. But like, you get to a point that you kind of go, oh, "You're separated. All right, I don't, I don't care." Yeah. Like, you're, I don't care. I'm, I'm just want to have a bit of crack. I think sometimes it's more hassle to separate than stay together. Yeah, well, a lot of people stay together for the kids. 
Mm. That's what I've heard. And I know you talk about like people are living separately is separate TVs. Two mm. TVs in the house. Mm. My brother just got a TV in one side of his house and the other side. And every time I call in, he's in one TV and she's in the other TV. His oh. wife is in the other TV. No, they're, they're very happily married. Can I just say that? But my point is, is that my mom and dad used to have the separate TVs and they were like, that's, he, she, my mom has her programs. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Coronation Street, the EastEnders, the Prime <laughs> Times, the, the talk shows. My dad then would have watched whatever History Channel, the news, got sports. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think sometimes it's kind of like, yeah, and you just meet on the stairs to bed. It is. Well, the <laughs> well, thing is, the Queen and Prince Philip used to do that. They used to meet up on the landing. They had separate bedrooms. Did they? Yeah. You watch The Crown, and obviously The Crown is, I don't know if it's accurate, but I, because I often look, my kids have got their own bedrooms, and they spread out at night in perfect comfort, and I thought, I pay the mortgage, and I'm bunking up with some other prick. <laughs> Do you not think I, that's weird? When you bump bump up with the woman you met when you were eighteen. Yeah, 19. and I, I always I always think that I think we would have separate beds. I'm, we're very happy, but I think we desperately need a spare room. Actually, what, what was the last? Because I come in at weird times as well. Yeah, you coming in? Come, coming in at like two in the morning, pitch black. There's scatter cushions everywhere. It's like Ninja Warrior trying to get to my side of the bed. I've got my torchlight bumping into shit. You and know, does your wife just, wake up when you come in? No, she's. I mean, this is a thing now. We've been. I've been doing comedy so long that Gemma will not wake up. So it's like if, if someone was burgling in our, our house, as long as they said they'd had a good gig, <laughs> she wouldn't even realise it wasn't me. Yeah, they've taken the kids and the telly and all your personal belongings. Yeah, but I smashed that I gig smashed last night. Yeah, oh, it was really good, yeah. You know but I, mean? I, I think, yeah, it's a weird one because we're not going to bed at the same time, which is strange. I but think. if you're out of the house five nights a week, yeah. what, what are you doing on the other two nights? Oh, I'm at home. Just yeah. chatting. And yeah, but, but then the thing is as well, Gemma's got into her routine. So her routine is to go to bed early, like 10, which I think is early. Oh, for me, that's way but, early, I mean, yeah. that's, uh, we're basically nocturnal, aren't we? I'm living like 10, badgers, comedians. I'm up at 10 to 5 for the radio, and I'm still not going to bed till 11. I don't know how you're doing that, mate. You must be running on fumes. No, I've no kids. I've, I enjoy it. Like, yeah. to me... It's going to all catch up on you, though, on one oh, you day. Know what? You know what? You're just I... gonna get, it's just going to hit you with one big wave of tiredness. I enjoy it. But you enjoy the adrenaline. I enjoy the buzz of going on radio and stuff like that. So to me, if it's something I enjoy, yeah. I, I just go for it. I don't yeah. worry about it. Like it's listen, as a comic, I've slept in for fifteen years. Did you? As you know what I mean? I don't do rush hour. Even now with the radio, like I'm in before rush hour. I don't see this rush hour that people yeah. have. And we read out the traffic and stuff, and I'm like, going, how can people sit in this for, for fifty minutes a day? Yeah. I'm always remembered I always remember that that line from point break. Which is, you know, the Patrick Swayze when he says, Look at all the people there in their metal coffins. <laughs> I always remember That's a that. It's a great line. It's a great line. I, a lot of my lines I remember come from films. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it's, falling it's quite down. Sad, do you remember, do you remember it? falling down? It's, it's brilliant. And he couldn't, he just had enough of his life. Do you know what? That Love film, that. Uh, Michael Douglas, that encapsulates perfectly a man losing his shit. There's no better film. Yeah. The, the the point when he's in the traffic and he's sweating and the speeds of sweat are coming yeah. down and he's trying to hit that fly, you feel the claustrophobia yeah. of that scene. If it's any, magnificent. If there's anybody out there that's not seen the film Falling Down, what came out, late 90s? Yeah, 1993. Oh, no, sorry, late, oh, early 90s. Falling Down with Michael Douglas. Yeah. Just watch it. You'll probably, you'll get it somewhere online. It it, it was a it was a film of, the, of, of its time where yeah. people who were in that sort of nine to five and mm. they're going to do it. And listen to some brilliant jobs that are nine to five. And some people are very happy doing it. And it's a great way. And I've done it for years and I'd happily go and do it again. And I've, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. But there comes to a point sometimes when you know when you're sitting in the car. There was a couple of times I used to do it when I lived yeah. in Manchester. Like I used to go and work in a bank. And I used to get the bus. I used to get the uh, the 86 from Charlton come Hardy to <laughs> Manchester Piccadilly. And sometimes I would be starting at eight o'clock. And I would have to get the bus at ten past seven to get me in for about tw 20 to eight. 10 minute walk to the office so I would be up say half 6 25 to 7 right yeah. and I remember going in in the winter and you're sitting in the bus yeah. and you're like I'm choosing this yeah I'm and, choosing and this and whereas, it's, it's dead time whereas, whereas when I get up in the morning to go to the radio I'm like Whoa yeah the mentality is different because it's something you enjoy yeah it takes a long time for people to find that yeah and I, I think I think the commute is getting harder for me as a comic now yeah. in my 40s Mid forties. You've done the you've done the mileage already. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, my car's currently in the garage. By the way, and oh, is it? I find out whether it's dead or not this week. They haven't. They have, there's a priest it's a, coming. It's a bad time. That is there, car. Is, is there a priest? Yeah, coming it's been to... given the last rites. 
<laughs> They've put a blanket over it. They're just going to drape a blanket over it. I tried as well because I always feel like I, I always feel like we've had a bond, me and that car. What car is it? It's a Kia. Right. Yeah. Family car as well, isn't it? Yeah, proper family car. I mean, it's full of yogurt raisins and <laughs> it's just it's it's filthy. And, and regret. But, but I, yeah, I I sort of whisper into the air vents before I took it in. I sort of said, please don't let me down. Uh, it's been a, we've, we've had fun we yeah, think of all those services we stopped but, that but with the engine malfunction light was flashing and I've just dropped it before I came here I dropped it at the garage and I said I know this is dead I know I know you're going to tell me it's over and yeah. it's an awful moment because yeah. I feel like I feel like I should be with it how long have you had the car? Um, not that long four years but well, what have you done on it? 150 oh it's 140,000 miles yeah. I mean they, they garages when they get your car as a comic they don't understand like what? What have you been doing? I've been doing. How do you? How do you yeah. put a hundred thousand on in four years? Yeah, that's twenty five thousand a year. Yeah, so I've literally been driving round the North Circular just continually. Mate, I'm up and down the M6, the M1, the M5, yeah. the M3, the M20, the M. Oh, uh, like, yeah, I'm and on it, it. I, and I think that's getting harder for me now. Yeah, I think. Um, because you see, you travel and obviously up and down the motorways of England. We, I've done it. Mm. Like I've done the whole thing. People think like, oh, I... some people have actually said to me like, oh, you come to Belfast and all of a sudden we've heard of you. I've been around quite a while. Yes, you have. Yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, you're an old sage. No, now, I'm mate. not an old sage, but like I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like I just I just worked hard and I worked a lot to yeah. the consequence of a personal life. Yeah. When you well, you do. It is a sacrifice, isn't it? When you first start, yeah. people say, "Can you come to this wedding?" No. When is it? It's three years away. Busy. That's the reality. Yeah. Well, you're married now and obviously being a comedian. Can I ask a question if you don't mind sharing? What was the last argument you had with your wife? Oh, like, do you and your wife have you have your little tiffies? Like, yeah. I thought you said you were going to do that. Yeah. Do it. We, what Pick we, her, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, what was the things where you're like, this is, we're not right? Well, the thing is with, with me and Gemma is we sort of blow up and then very quickly resolve. So we have like those moments where it, it comes to a head. We get rid of the tension and then we very quickly make up. And what's again. the most common? We never thing sort you... of like, I, you, you know, it seems to be a thing like, I think if you were like older people, like her grandma and granddad once, her grand, her grandma didn't speak to her granddad for a month because he did something wrong. And back then they used to dig in, didn't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> back then they were like, this is, you're, I'm going to make you pay for a month yeah, for a this. Month, yeah. uh, but for, for, for Gemma, I'll tell you what we argue about most is that I'm not good at internalizing my anxiety. So you're there a, you go. You're a, you're not, you, That's you an offload it. Like. I offload it yeah. because I've got, I always feel like I've got no one to speak to. So like I sort of talk to Gemma, but then I realise that I'm sort of, it's not helpful. So that's what we tend to argue about is my approach to life. She gets frustrated that I cannot uh, meet her, my anxiety. What is her common thing that she says to you that frustrates her about you? Oh God, I I think it's I think it's just the fact that I'm a bit like there's a, I get a little bit OCD about stuff. So for example, we have silly little arguments like we've got I've got a ring doorbell and I Gemma doesn't lock a car, right? So this is a main argument we have at the moment. I think in a couple, some people are really security conscious, others are very lackadaisical. I leave my front door open. Sometimes. Yeah, so I couldn't live with that. I, like I go to that bed and I'm like, do and my I, head I come down tomorrow. Go, oh, I never locked it last. That night. would do my head in. So Gemma doesn't lock a car, and I know this because the wing mirrors are open. So if I'm away and I check the camera, I just send her a message saying, "Wing mirrors out, car is open," and it annoys me because I, 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 then she'll say, "Well, I forget," and I go, "But yeah, but just lock it as you're walking away, or we'll be together and we'll be walking away from her car, and she won't." And, and I'm thinking, "Is I was going to lock press it? The button. Are we going to press the button?" Then I say, press the button. She says, I'm just going to do it. So that's what we argue about most. Yeah. It's a different approaches to life's, you know, admin. Yeah. One thing I would say that I get have got frustrated in the past, like, like I'm not married. Like, you're, you know, you've been with your partner since you were, what, 18, 19. I'm not married, no kids, right? Is um, I get really, really frustrated and I have done in the past with people in relationships who just are not on the front foot. Right. What do you mean by that? Like a little bit of oomph about them, like a little bit of get up and go. Yeah. Like I once, I once went out with a girl, right? And uh, now some people say like, oh, maybe there was some underlining issues. Don't You don't need to be so harsh. Yeah. Under this girl, uh, she's very nice. And uh, 
summer. So imagine summer in London, 25 degrees, 28 degrees. You're getting a good eight weeks of stuff, weather, right? And every day, come on, let's go out and do something. Four o'clock in the afternoon, still in our dressing gown. That's an awful thing. All that kind of stuff. Now people say, oh, maybe that person was depressed. They weren't. They were just lazy. Mm. They were just bone fucking idle. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go to the gym. I might go play some golf. I might call up to my cousin. And then you go out and you do your own thing. And then I'm the bad person. Yeah. Because I'm like, I'm not wasting this day. I work five nights a week. I have two days off with you. And you don't want to do anything. Yeah. Or maybe they're tired from their job. They didn't work. It's, it's a very difficult one. That I mean, if you think that's hard, it's basically like trying to get your kids out for a walk. Because that's the default option on a Sunday. Mm. Is I'll feel that the day is slipping. And I can feel it drifting. And yeah. I think I'm at home and I have to try and make it count. Yeah. And then that annoys Gemma because she's like, you're now trying to fit back into our system because you want to capitalise on this day that yeah. you've got. And when I suggest going for a walk with the kids, they look at me like I've said, you know, do you want me to waterboard you for two <laughs> hours? I think they'd prefer that because kid, no kid wants to go for a walk, but that's the only idea you have to try and connect. So I, I think like Gemma always says, I mean, you've got this tick list in your head of what you're trying to, to be the perfect father. Yeah. And I think I try and compensate because I am away a lot so that when I'm at home, I have this like beautiful, perfect, you know, family you know life. I see it because I see other families. If you go out for a walk, you always see that family. Like the dad will be dragging a kid on the scooter. They'll be in like matching Berghaus. She'll have made some sandwiches. They're not happy, Scott. They're, yeah, they seem happy. Or They're not smug. happy. They're, They're not smug. happy. It really annoys me because I watch them and I think, how is this? I feel like going up to them and going, how do you make this happen? Because my two, she's fucking on a scooter, dragging her foot in the gravel. She doesn't want to go. The eldest is on her phone. No one wants to be here. The wife's car has just been nicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the wing mirrors were out. <laughs> and I'm just like, so I look at people and I compare. I compare. And but they're not happy. Most people are not happy. Mm, I, yeah. Maybe they are. <laughs> Maybe I'm unhappy and I just want you to be unhappy. But I'm just yeah. saying it. Yeah. You look at him and go, that's not all, it's not all that perfect. Yeah. It's not all that fucking perfect. But I have problems in everything I do. Every relationship I have problems. Not major problems. And my current relationship is fantastic. My current. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Julie. <laughs> Julie, relax, will you? Current. Julie! Is, yeah. My pre- you need to change that Don't to move previous out. now. Yeah, pre- my previous. It's, yeah. Yes. No money joking. It, but it is, I think, I think compatibility is really interesting because there's certain things that in a relationship... I've started to see it like, you know, the guide, the TV guide yeah. on the telly. I can scroll through that 100 miles an hour. I can see what's on. You've... So for me, I can go like that yeah. fast. I've got fast eyes. And I go, there's nothing on. Let's go to bed. Gemma. Oh, channel by channel. Channel by channel. Reading this. I'm like. Th- what are you th- looking for? What are you this, looking this for? This is late night. What are you looking for? It's late night deals with Derek on QVC. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing to find out. What's this? History. World War II. Should we watch that? No. But it's it's my fault because I'm trying to key back in to the rhythm of the house yeah. that I don't. F- so that that is the challenge, I think. All the, A lot of the tension comes from me trying to assimilate back <laughs> as a dad. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's a weird It's one. really interesting, isn't it? Like mm. how the dynamic of a family, when you're away a lot and stuff like that, because a lot of comics like broke up over lockdown. Really? There's loads of comics. Oh, because they're normally away they and home. then they're brought back and then they go, the oh, this guy's like, a dick. The wife's like, get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you're legally not allowed out. Well, we're done. Yeah, I can see that. I'm used to hanging out with you two days a week. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. That's true. What's your relationship with Ireland like? Um, Growing up as a kid, what did you hear about us? What did you know about us? What? How did you feel? What things you read in the news? Well, you know um, what I mean. My mum, her dad was born in Cork. Well, well, well. So there is a little well, well, Irish well. connection, and obviously I'm what wearing part of Cork? bottle green. I don't know anything other than typical that. English. <laughs> oh, my family are from Cork. What part? Don't know. You don't yeah. give a shit then, do you? You didn't care about it. So why are you bringing it up? It's not who do you think you are. I've not really done any more research than that. But that is, uh, there's an Irish connection there. Excuse me, and um, but I, I think, no, I haven't had that much experience really. And what do you mean? Is in what did we think? Yeah, like of what, it? What, 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 what was your impression of the place? What did, well, what obviously, did you, what we... did you get to? Like, when I was growing up as a kid, we were always like, oh, fuck the English, like beat yeah. them at football, beat them at rugby, and obviously England was very dominant over us and stuff like that, like in a lot of sports and stuff, yes, and economy and all that. And now you know people would have to have leave, left leave Ireland and go to England to work. Yes. And like obviously there's a massive Irish community, especially in the Midlands of England now in Birmingham and all these places yeah. in London and all that. 
Now it's kind of like flipped. We're a really strong economy. Yeah. Really strong in the world. You know, we have a lot of problems just like every other country with housing, yeah. homelessness, addiction, domestic violence. There's problems in every country. You know what I mean? There's nothing, you know what I mean? But what was your in- interpretation of this place? Well, it, obviously there was the politics side of it, which yeah. uh, I grew up in sort of the 90s. I was sort of, yeah, that was my, my main pre ceasefire. Yes. So it was sort of a strange type. The PR over here was probably, <laughs> it was, wasn't great. It wasn't great. And it was sort <laughs> of like there was a lot of aggression and stuff. But then, well, then I genuinely think like now, I mean, you look at the UK, we can't get HS, HS2 has gone down the pan. There's so many embarrassing things that have happened in the UK that we can't seem to get basic infrastructure right. And then you come here and it seems to be working. Yeah, it things seem to work, and and it's. I think I think there was a, there, there was a there was a perception that maybe Ireland was stuck so many years back behind, but it's never been. I don't think. No, it's very forward. It is it's very absolutely forward. like Northern Ireland, especially in this part here in the north. And um, the people I find here are very very progressive. Yeah, insanely progressive. But the politics, certain aspects of the politics, is insanely behind. And I often feel that Northern Ireland, it needs a bit of a, aesthetically, it needs a bit of a facelift. It needs investment. Right. It needs to get itself fucking going because I've been here three years. Nothing's been done. Yeah. Like, nothing has been done. This place, I'm, I'm sick of saying it, like, could be a beacon of light and great opportunity Well, and I, investment I, here, you know? Yeah, and I, I pe- people are very friendly. Like, even, like, I got, when I came off the plane, I was trying to get a shuttle bus into city centre. That's four people helped me. They were like, no, you need to do this. No, they they're trying to, to gather information. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they're trying to gather information. They've put a tag on you to track. Anytime an English person lands in Belfast, right. they get tagged. I did, I so did there's feel... dots going round in a, in a head office somewhere. They were like, oh, there's a guy there. No, oh, he's, oh, he's there. there. Like, we're tagging. We, we got you all tagged. They're it's like, like the enemy of the state or something. Yeah, they're just yeah. looking at me on a, on a big screen. Oh, there's an English one there. Go over and talk to him. Look at him, still going to Costa, the mainstream Costa and Starbucks. Yeah, yeah he's not. He's not taking in the but local like, culture. What, what did you know about like uh, the troubles in the north? Well, obviously, we saw all we saw, and I remember being at school and there was bomb threats when I was at school, which was really odd. I, I, I not in your school. Yeah, where? Which school? Well, I was in like near Leeds. But I, I think that Sean, did the IRA go to Leeds? You know everything about the IRA, don't you? <laughs> I'm only yeah, joking. Says, he don't, I don't. I, say it, so, man. It was around <laughs> the time. So. Well, it was around the time of like Warrington and all that. Oh lot. Jesus! Yeah. So like, they I were th- rampant then. It was rampant. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was there was a culture, and I actually think now it was some Scally's brother. There's having ringing a laugh, like, yeah. because he's he's gone. I don't. I want to go and have a three hour play time on the field because that's what they used to do yeah. so he, he can ring up I feel like they just rang up and went he's not even Irish this guy <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> he's got a Yorkshire yeah, accent yeah there's a bomb outside yeah, about, yeah. you are with the yeah. yeah. R-I-A yeah. <laughs> there's no fuse in it because they're expensive you know that's <laughs> what I'm saying but then we'd have like three hour play times on the field I do remember that because I think round that time no one really knew what was happening because obviously there was the the Manchester, I think it was Arndale Centre. There was Canary a few, Wharf, yeah, Canary Wharf. There was a few. There was a few Brighton, I think. No, that was like seven, mm. late seventies, wasn't it? But I think there was a bit. There was a bit of a weird atmosphere where you genuinely thought something could happen at any time. Yes, and and probably it was. I don't know where it came from, but I genuinely remember around that sort of mid nineties, ninety three to ninety five, when I was at high school. There was a lot of um, bomb threats, mm. which is sort of strange, really. And yeah. I, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, but obviously, as well, you're in politically. You didn't really know. And then obviously, we used to watch the news, and there was like Jerry Adams and mm. McGuinness. They used to change the voice. Yeah, he was banned from being on. It was banned, TV, but yeah. he could be on telly, but they didn't do his voice. Yeah. If I'm sure that's right, really they used to dub yeah. his voice. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. But so that you're watching the news and you're going, that's like a weird sort of. Batman buddy, <laughs> just strange. Isn't it? They, weird, they wouldn't let yeah. him speak his own voice, and then you were like, "What's going on here?" And then obviously there was the stuff with uh, when I'm sure they made uh, the the was it the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah. Don't know when that came in, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good Friday, mate. Oh, Good Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Losing the name, uh, but yeah, it, it did. I remember when it stopped, and I remember how amazing it was that how, how much of a big deal that was. But we we came for a wedding. God, I've just remembered that. We had friends and they were married at the Stormont Hotel. Oh, wow. 
So would that make her? Sean, that's her, posh, isn't it? Her it dad, indeed. her yeah. dad was in the RUC, Royal Ulster Constabulary. Yes, and she remembers. What of Sean's favourite police forces? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she remembers having to have someone wand under the car every day before yeah. the school run. Check for bombs and stuff. So yeah. I remember going to their wedding. So that would make them Protestant, yeah? Is that right? Sean? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm being painted in such a bad light in this book. But, <laughs> I'm not getting out of here, am I? I've I got am. a fly book tomorrow. Sean, Sean, answer that question. Well, Sean, you grew up here. I, don't, I can't comment on it. Like, you know what I mean? I'm not, I didn't grow up here, so I, can't, I don't want to make assumptions. No, you know? you're, you're just right. The thing is, you've got an Irish accent. You're, I, I'm, yeah, I'm but, English. I'm the one who's going to take the fall. This, like, and I'm this, wearing green. I've like, tried my best. I view <laughs> Ireland as an all-Ireland, even though there's a different jurisdiction kind of up here. And I'm really? not, I don't want to get involved in all that. I view everyone just whatever. Like, I don't really yeah. probably care you know like but like I view it all it's very interesting how I often find it very interesting how English people view this place because when I was living in England no one knew Anton yeah they knew the basics well we had to go we I remember coming here for the wedding and they had to drive it felt like we drove for hours to find a Protestant church would that be right just so, depends where you are. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I've just got vivid no, memories lot, no, of it. No, well, and then they had the they had the reception at the Stormont. Okay, well, I I, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, that's the only. It's an interesting yeah. thing, isn't it? But then you you could still see. So obviously, the fact that he was in the RUC, it was a it's a weird sort of. They were almost in a divided. She lived in divided and in right in the middle of it, really. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, but like from what I've gathered here, like obviously. I never, it wasn't a lived experience for me, but living here for me, man, I couldn't live in a more friendlier place, you know? Yeah. More pa- safe place. Is there still the massive religious? No. Is that still part it's of it? It's just in interface areas and, and Re- stuff really? like that. And small you areas, imagine. Yeah, like, um, and it's also... Because religion on, on a whole, even in the UK, nah. is sort of dwindling, Fuck. isn't it? Now, do you, yeah. How do you think people view England? What, as in... How, like, how do you think like other people's view of England is... Because, well, like, this this is my honest opinion, right? Like, about mm. everything that's happened in the last sort of seven years with Brexit and the negative undertones mm. and the rhetoric from coming out from the UK government, it's kind of gone a bit to the right and, and, to yeah. the right and all that. And the lies becoming a little bit very like America. You can kind of lie yeah. and still get away with it. And I don't like it. Like, I'll give you an example. In the pandemic down south, we had an EU, an EU commissioner and they went to play golf and they had a meal afterwards. And some of the requirements of the meal, not all, but some of them weren't adhered to as in social distancing. They all lost their jobs. He was in a big job. Wow. Right? And there was a high accountability down south for it. Yeah. And one thing I noticed about, like, one of our biggest political scandals, I'm talking about politicians' behaviour, I'm not talking about policy and all that <coughs> kind of stuff, is that one, uh, min- our Minister Pascal Donoghue, he, when he was campaigning to be re-elected as an MP or a TD, as we call it, he never put in a receipt for some of his posters. And he nearly Expenses. lost his job as Minister for Finance, like. As, the, as like the chancellor Man, if you are minister as, like, as like the chancellor but the receipt was like two grand and he said yeah I just never accounted for it no but the taxpayer as far as I'm concerned I could be wrong the taxpayer didn't pay it he just underclaimed or overclaimed yeah. but he, he sorted it out straight away but that was massive wow in terms of the accountability is it the moral aspect of it yeah though? like I think no, no Irish, one likes to be moralised by someone who's I think Ireland have gro- I, th- I, th- I must admit though when I compare Ireland to England in terms of accountability yeah we're so much better. Yeah. Like the bullshit that comes. Like I view England here now as the people are fantastic. The politics are disgusting. It's oh, disgusting, mate. And also as well as, you know, we're swimming in shit. Yeah. That's unavoidable. You're, you're turning your back on, on cooperation. Yeah. With the it, rest of the world. I, I, it's not in a good spot at the moment. And the, the really mad thing as well is they always, a lot of the politicians that have done well are good speakers. And they're good at well, they're selling. Telling, they're telling people what they want to hear. Yeah, so people are like, oh, I'd love to go for a pint with them. And I feel like going, that's not the basis to vote someone mm-hmm. in, is it? Yeah. Oh, I bet they're good fun to go for a pint. I don't care about going for a pint with them. I just want to swim in a river that hasn't got shit in it. Yeah. And I think like that's what I think people say about likability and all that. Well, I don't really want to go, I don't really want to go for a pint with most of my friends half yeah. the time. Why would I want to go for a pint with that? Like... I, I, when I was living over in England, I was, I, I, I lived two years under Tony Blair, and then the rest I was under Conservative, right? Mm. And I know it's going to sound, but bring back David Cameron, bar the Brexit vote. At least he was, I didn't, not a fan of him, but he wasn't the worst of them. And well, people will say he was the worst of them, but you know what I mean. He was actually. It's, it's very interesting. He was, the, he was the best of a bad bunch. Yeah, I always find it very interesting when like working class 
people vote for a Conservative government. Yeah, but there... Because I, I just think, why do you want to put billionaires in charge? As if they're going to relate to you. As well, it, it makes no sense. The thing is, they're telling people who pay, who may, like it's in Trump as well, you know, they're telling people what they want to hear. The reason you're not doing well is because of these things. Yeah. So I'll come in and fix these things and you'll do well. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we just believe that. It's, it, the reason we're not doing well isn't our fault. Yeah. It's someone else's fault. Yeah, yeah. And like with Trump, it's like, we need to, the immigrants, they're taking, I'm like, it's, no, but like, the thing is like, say for example, I'm on a very low income and I'm struggling and you're the same age as me and you're on a medium to high income. Say for example, right? And I see you in the same edu- school that I went to and the same school that I went to and we both live in the same area. Yeah. Right? And we both got the same education. But you're earning an extra 30 grand a year. Yeah. But you're earning it and then they're telling me that I'm not earning it because of the foreigners. But you're earning that money while their foreigners are here. Yeah, yeah. So you can still do it. Yeah. Yeah. So so how the reason you're not doing well is because of A, B, C and D. Well, you're doing well with A, B, C and D. So it is achievable to do well. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And my point is is that, to, and I think it comes down to people who are just not, maybe not clued in enough mm. to realise. Do you ever see, when it comes to, you, you mentioned the Jimmy Savile, Steve Coogan thing, paedophiles, <coughs> they're staring you in the face. Yeah. The people that are actually, like, uh, robbing you are actually in front of you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And well, people can't seem to see it, that. You it, know? it does seem that way as well. And, and, and I, But I think it's becoming more evident as well and like i just find it really surreal that at the moment the prime minister has like got a butler or he's got he's got like he's, he's you know he's a, he's a billionaire or something yeah can't use contactless doesn't understand what it is just like it just doesn't even seem like he's human but he knows how stressful you're about about your gas bill and your electric bill and your fuel your fuel for the winter and your kids school books yeah how can you relate to that well you can't that's the point so i don't know but then no one wants to do it I've spoke to, I, I was talking about this with Gemma, like no one in politics, people go into politics, they don't, they do go in with like trying to make things better. I'm sure that a part of it, small percentage is genuine, but a lot of it is because they can get on, they can get to power and, you know, really you can make a lot more money being a CEO of a business. Yeah. But they, they do it because they want the power and that's never a good starting when point. When someone wants I don't power... Think. I don't it's think dangerous. it's dangerous. Yeah. dangerous. And I think it corrupts. And I think that's the problem. I think everyone says, well, why don't we get someone who's a really good business person and then they'll w- run the country? No, because it's, it's a shit job. And they don't want the power. And no one wants to hassle. Mm. It's like the it's like a football manager's job. Like It's like the England football, football manager's like, job. If you take it's the, like no one wants it. Take the Premier League this year. I would say last year, what? 11 managers got sacked. I'd mm. say maybe eight might get sacked this year. Yeah. But when they, they go, sack me you're going to pay me a fortune to yeah. leave. And the cycle continues. People are like, yeah, like I like to do it. But when I get sacked, I make a lot of money. And Boris Johnson is making more money than he's ever made now. Yeah. I can imagine him on the, can you imagine him on the after dinner circuit? What well, shook hands with a COVID patient? <laughs> I bet they're laughing. Got shit faced in the garden. <laughs> I bet he's doing jokes like that. Yeah. Stories like that. We should book him. Yeah. We should try and book <laughs> for Boris a Johnson. Ten. For a tight 10. <laughs> and just put him in a, you know what I mean? And see what, he, see what he's talking about. But it's, I uh, look. I get. I get really frustrated as someone who has like a, a light overview of politics. Yeah. You think to yourself, "Oh man, you you are just one fucking narcissist, like trying to trying to steal power here." You know, and it really yeah. bugs me. And when I was living in England, like there were so many people like that. Yeah. Like I, Dominic Rab. Yeah. I've never seen such a slimy fucker <laughs> before. Like he's it's, gone now, isn't he? Yeah. A lot of them as well. You just you just think like you go like they sort of live in a world that I always think like they're playing a game that we aren't even aware what the rules mm. are. So there's the sort of, the, the, you're never going to, like this levelling up idea is oh. hilarious because it's almost like we're going to... Who we, created the unlevel? Yeah, yeah. The, you did. You've been in power for no, 15 there's years. There's no levelling up. Do you know what I mean? The North's always, like I, when I go to London, like there's always like cranes and development. I think in the North, we've got like two cranes <laughs> that we have to share. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like a weird thing. There's definitely, there's no, there's no uh, motivation to close that North-South divide. But do you really feel there is a divide? Definitely. Financially? Like... Well, I mean, I, I think the only reason I know that is I think I went to school in like a, quite a rough bit of, the, of Yorkshire, right? So our school, it was by fluke that I did well at school. It, I had to fight to do well. 
And I think that's probably because the area didn't have that much money in it and there's op- the, the opportunities weren't there. I always knew that I would have to leave to go get a job. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to stay where I lived because it's like an ex-mine in town, nothing there. And I, I always think that that's sort of... the w- It's a weird thing when you look at that and you go, that that drive... It, I, I always I say to Gemma, I said, I could never... I could never put my kids in private school because I feel like I would be sort of cheating on my roots in a yeah. weird way. But I totally understand why people do it. But you probably it. want your kids to fight and get a bit of resilience. Well, well also yeah. as well, though, but I totally get why people do it, which is because you don't have to fight to do well. And you, you're putting your kids into a system that's... It's a rigged system, isn't it? Mm. So like all these, all this idea of like, you know... I always feel like with state schools, like my wife was a teacher and she was bringing in stationery for the kids because there wasn't enough budget for pens. You know what I mean? So she's buying pens for her own pupils and you go like, that wouldn't happen in, in a school system that was, do you know what I mean? That, a private school system. So I, I don't know. I just, I, I think it's always been an unlevel playing field, actually. Mm. Uh, so it, uh, but I'm trying to teach my kids resilience, but it, I always still. What do you do? Just you put that sign up. The beatings will continue. No, I do, uh, once a week. Bruce. I just I drop them in the woods. Uh, once a week, drop <laughs> right, them in the see woods. See you Tuesday. See you, yeah, work your way back. Just give them a torch, a basic aerial bar. Leave them three or four days. They come crawling back. I say, <laughs> well done, nice one. They've been living off roadkill, you know. But they <laughs> spearing will spearing squirrels and stuff. Do you know what I mean? But uh, but yeah, I, I think kids don't have resilience. I mean, my my eldest is going to do a Duke of Edinburgh. Which has surprised both of us. Because well, what's, what's that entail? She, uh, well, she's not even. She doesn't get out of bed till midday on a weekend. How old is she? She's thirteen. Oh, so, is she one of them now. Ugh, go away. Yeah, she's knackered all the time. She's knackered from and what? she does nothing. She's knackered from doing nothing. But she bizarrely said, "I want to do a Duke of Edinburgh," and we were like, "Fantastic!" But what they don't realise now is they, when you sign up for a Duke of Edinburgh now, you have to do so many hours a week. They don't just let you do it in one go. So she has to do so many hours a week of exercise, so many hours a week of public uh, service. So she signed up for. She's gonna. It's gonna be interesting watching her do this. Really? Yeah. So I used to, I think it's gonna be brilliant. But yeah. yeah, that might be the the start of her to kind of come out of her shell a little. I bit. think so, and it's building the resilience in it because she's realised as well that money doesn't. That's what she's realised as well. She wants money. So like when she goes into town with her mates, she'll always tap me up. And then she said the other day, how do I get money? She said. So money. she's realised, how do I get money? And I said, well, you're going to have to work. You, for, you know, you're going to have to work. She said. Then she said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do babysitting. I said, that's a really that's good, good idea. One. She says, I'll start, I'll babysit uh, my sister. I was like, you live in the same house. You do that anywhere. That's yeah, a, that's a, that's I'm not a... paying you to be in your house. <laughs> what do you think this is? But she's real. I think she's seeing now that the, you know, the system, the capitalist system that we live in, which is interesting. Yeah, and it's not going to change. It's not. One thing I used, I'm, I'm writing a bit of stand up about at the moment is uh, about capitalism. You know, all these rich people. Yeah. You know, when like all these celebrities come out and go. Remember when Jeremy Corbyn was in politics in England? He was a Labour Labour Party, and that that went well. Yeah. And um, people you come out, and go, hey guys, we all need to go socialism. You know, it's really good, it's really important. Vote left. I'm like, we need to share the world. It says a millionaire actor. I'm like, yeah, but yeah, but you're a millionaire. Like capitalism yeah. works because it worked for you. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you've got all this money. You want to do something else. Yeah. I don't like capitalism. No, you, mate, it, there's no risk to you. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy to say it when there's yeah. no risk to you. There's people out there living week to week. Yeah. Week to week. Yeah. I went on holiday to Greece, right? Took a week off. What happens when a comedian goes on holiday? We take a week off. You're going to Crete soon, right? Yeah. No money. No money coming in that week. But yeah. I'm also spending. Yeah. I go a week and I, I go and I go, oh, why don't you go for two weeks? I can't, I can't go for two weeks. Yeah. It's two weeks of not earning. It's two weeks of not earning spending. my wages. Yeah, yeah. And spending on a holiday. Absolutely. That's a month. I'm down a month. In a whole year, down a month's yeah. wage. It's massive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And people don't get that. Whereas, you know, when you're on PAYE and you're getting your monthly payment and you're whatever, your five weeks holidays a year and you, you know what I mean? You go on away for two weeks, but it's paid because I'm getting yeah. my PAYE. Then people don't realise like when you're being self-employed, the risk you're taking and then to do that in a system that, like, under then, like, Tory governments and yeah. all that, where they're just fucking shafting you anyway. Like. I, I'm amazed that I've made it self-employed. It's yeah. completely against my personality. 
Yeah, and, and do you? you know, I, I struggle with it. Do, would you be nervous about it? Did you, did, you, did you worry about it? Oh, all the time. So, like, do you worry, like, you Provider's know, anxiety is brutal. Yeah, but like, forty-four, married, two kids. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I've got to feed these kids for another ten years. Oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah, and and I, I think I think that's the thing that comedy's been a, is a cash grab. It always has been. Yeah. For the way I see comedy is, you got to get in, make as much money as you can, and get out before you're too old to drive to Hull on a Friday. Yeah. And That's I, the reality. And there's a lot of comedians that are, you look at them and you go, better life choices, you wouldn't need to be here. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the thing. I always feel like there's a t- that's the anxiety that, much as I love this job, that's the one thing I've never been able to resolve is the fact that I'm running, I know I'm running out of road at yeah. some point. Well, I... I, I and and it's, you have to try and live in the moment, but I'm always looking ahead. What, what's coming? Yeah. That's why, like, I'm trying to do different things. I yeah. always want to be a comedian and I always want to perform, but when I get older, I want to be able to perform on my own terms. Yeah. And hopefully, touch wood, have a bit of a following that people would be interested in coming to see me, right? And I'd be mm. delighted if people people do. But also, to me, it's like, I'm trying to learn different things as well. Yeah. I want to write sketches. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe could end up, you know, going into writing, yeah. doing a bit of radio at the moment, uh, podcasting. I'd like to develop a chat show. Maybe maybe I could get into producing. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's just that it's like, I'll always still perform, but I don't want to be 62. Oh, I have to go to Liverpool for three nights now. Yeah. You know that, what I mean? I think, I think it's like a tree, isn't it? Stand-up's always been the centre branch, centre bit of the tree. Yeah. And the bits off it, are the bits that you'll always have the stem, like you'll, you'll always have, have the stem, yeah. but the bits off the sides are the bits you need yeah. to, to. It's it's not enough to just go and do twenty minutes somewhere. Yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, but you're going to be doing more than twenty minutes here in January. Tell us a little bit about your tour and what you're doing. So, so yeah, I'm coming January thirty first, twenty twenty four. I'm coming yeah. to the limelight. Very to good, do, great room. Yep, to do my solo show called Great Scott. Great Scott, he's great. Great Scott, great Scott, Scott anime. Yeah. Amazing, that isn't it? That would took about twenty seconds mm. to come up with that. Yeah. Um, it sounds it sounds arrogant now, but now I've, now I've done it. Great, Scott. Now it's for them to decide, isn't it? Yeah. But it's my best bits, favorite bits to stand up over the years, right. and uh, just to, it's just like, and we were talking about this. I don't do anything, you know what I mean? It's not over the top, like you know, you're not going to be think having to think heavily. You're not it's just into a poly- really good night It's out. just stand up, and I just Scott, I've worked up. with you many times before, mate. And yeah. like you got a lot of success there recently in terms of your BBC Radio Four, your live with the Apollo. And you know what? One thing you probably don't even know is the amount of green rooms were t- that were delighted for you. Oh, that's funny. When I was sweet. in England, like things I'd be doing the Birmingham Glee or the Stand or something like that, and you'd be in a green room and a bit McCaffrey or M- Carol Donnelly, and they're all like, "Oh, Scott Bennett, the live with the Apollo." Every single person was like, "I'm delighted for Scott. Oh, He's a hard working nice. comic." Yeah. And you don't realize there's a lot of good. There's a lot of goodwill out there between comics, and there's a lot of. Like, you know what I mean? And we all know who they are. <laughs> yeah. And we know who they are, don't we, Sean? Yeah. Hold on. Oh, Sean knows them as well. Anyway, my point is this: is is that like there's a lot of goodwill because you just do really good stand up. Yeah. Like you do really good stand up comedy. I remember doing a gig with you once, and I was like, you were doing this thing about the Carvery, mm. going to the Carvery. I was like, oh, I was like, how how did I not think of that? Yeah. Like you know when you see someone doing a bit, I'm like, yeah. how did I? That's staring me in the face. Yeah. But yeah, but you have announced to go and do a really good anecdotal observational stand up. So. Yeah. If you are in Belfast at the end of January, please do go and check out Scott Bennett. We had him on the radio. He's on the he's on the Empire tonight with me. This is going out obviously on Thursday, so he'll he'll have gone home. He'll have gone home, right? But all his links will be below. So please do go and support. And listen, you can see all of, you can see me whenever. But when people like Scott put the effort in to fly over here, it's great that comedians from all over Europe, all over America, all over England are coming to Northern Ireland to perform here. Please do go and support them. Okay, it's a night out. Take your friends, take your partner. The show is what, an hour and a half, something like that? Um, Yeah, an hour and a half. And then there's an interval. So it's just, it's... 45 minutes each. Yeah. Brilliant. 45 minutes. No support. I support myself. He supports himself. <laughs> there you go. That's what I do. So the most I'm important... Family. I'm, I'm my family, yeah. <laughs> so so the most important thing that you do is is go and check it out. Um, Scott, your socials? Uh, Scott B Comedy UK that's right. the social and Scott Bennett Comedy dot co dot UK so on Instagram and all, but we'll put yeah. everything little like below down yeah. there for you and stuff like that okay but listen this is the first episode in the new studio a few things that we need to fix we're going to get better with the lighting with the with the backgrounds and stuff like that but we like putting it out the way it is anyway so you can see the like development because people love a journey people love a journey don't they that's why they watch like The Apprentice oh let's follow who wins yeah. and then the wins they don't give a shit yeah yeah, everyone likes someone who's on a little quest. Yeah, and they? in Love Island, oh, 
who's getting eliminated. They don't care about the result. You care about the journey. And then in Britain, they love watching someone disintegrate. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards. This is this is gonna happen. Yeah, that's what they do. Like in six months' time, crash and burn. podcast is gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will never financially recover from this move to the new studio. Yeah, yeah. So listen, if you do like the pod, please do subscribe, share, and uh, go sign up to the Patreon. It really does help. Tickets for the live show will be up there soon. First dibs on them are to the patrons only. Really appreciate it. And if you want to send in some comments and questions for next week's podcast as well by commenting below. Um, on the YouTube as well that would be great listen thanks very much to everyone that's uh, joined us this week Scott Bennett fantastic to have you on as the first guest thank in the new you. studio I'm honoured really do appreciate it yeah. a great stand up comic a good mate of mine it's great to see you thank thanks you. for coming here Scott thank Bennett you.